Let's get started here. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ben Potashnik. Uh, I'm going to be moderating this. We're going to try to give everybody seven minutes, five to seven minutes to speak. Some people will take less or more as we we'll want. And then we'll try to have some questions and answers at the end of the session. Um, this is the Representative Democracy Plenary, which represents the election integrity organizations, the election integrity organizations, uh, the organizations that are working on campaign finance reform, third party, and some of the other issues such as, um, you know, uh, suppression of the vote and, and, and issues that pertain to how our elections are handled, how the mechanisms of democracy work. We all know that democracy is under attack by forces that would prefer that we do not, as a people, unite and work together. We've spoken about this quite consistently in this conference. I think you're all aware that we have to regroup, reorganize, and become a better at what we have assumed till now is already given, which is democracy that this country is really a democratic society. We have to fight back for what we fought back for back in the 1700s and generations <clears throat> afterwards. Uh, I'm a former state senator from Vermont. I quit being a senator after two terms to go live in an organic farm in Mexico where I'd had my second home for years. Uh, I live off the grid, have wind generator, solar power, rainwater catchment, uh, I live in an adobe house. Uh, this past month we had 120 kids we were teaching organic agriculture to. We, uh, I'm trying to live the life that I've been talking about for the last 40 years. And I felt I had to come back to work at this democracy issue. And uh, I'm uh, my partner, Victoria, who is uh, the coordinator of the National Election Integrity Coalition, is over there in the blue sweater. Hi, Victoria. Victoria Collier just had an article in Harper's Magazine, which was a real breakthrough for inte election integrity. It was an article about how elections have been stolen in this country, how dangerous the process of elections has become because of electronic voting, because of the easy manipulation that could happen, how the elections are now being controlled very much by machines that are, have proprietary software, how there's very much a lot of room for fraud and more coming as we move into the age of elections on the internet. Right now, e-voting on the internet is a big issue that's spreading throughout Canada and it's coming to your town. All I have to say about that is if the NSA could read your texts and your tweets, and if the NSA knows every phone call you made, they'll know how you voted. So think about that. The secret ballot will be gone when this when our elections go to the internet. Now the kids love it because they can vote on their phones, okay? But democracy will be over as we know it because then your boss can know how you voted and your government can know how you voted. And if you're a dissenter and you want to vote against the government, they'll know how you voted. So we will be all living in fear when we go to vote. So please remember that. If, that, if there's anything you take out here, okay? So with that, I'd like to start with our first speaker, who is going to be Mike McCabe, who is from the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, and he's going to speak about the fight of our lives. And I want, would you, would, you can use the podium up there so people can see you. We're filming this and we're going to have this conference and this workshop on the internet on electionintegritycoalition.com. Me. Thank you, Ben, and, and thank you all for coming. I, I don't have to tell any of you that, that we face threats to our democracy that, that we have not seen in our lifetimes. We face greater threats to, to democracy than any time in living memory. You have to go back to the Gilded Age, the age of the robber barons, to find a period where there were comparable uh, threats to, to uh, American democracy. None of us is quite old enough to remember the, the days of the robber barons. Uh, and, you know, as I've spent some time here at the convention, I've been inspired by so many of you, the passion that you bring here to these conferences and, and the single-minded devotion that, that I pick up on for so many of you and whatever 
whatever dimension of the of the plagues that that, uh, that are warping our democracy that that impassion you that that single-minded devotion is impressive but I do have to offer this warning those who are seeking to dismantle democracy are not single-minded and we have to be every bit as ambitious and every bit as holistic in defending democracy and seeking to protect democracy as they are in seeking to dismantle it. No more silos. <laughs> and, and you know, we can't afford to reside in silos. We can't afford to compete with each other and consider our dimension of the democracy problem more important than somebody else's dimension. And there are, there are people who would say that, that, that the first problem, and perhaps the only problem, is making sure that votes are counted and counted accurately and fairly. And, and I am impressed by that, the devotion to that cause that I, that I experience here at this conference. But there will be others, and Larry Lessig, the Harvard University professor, just wrote that wonderful book, Republic Lost, and he said money in politics is the first problem. But, but you know, we can't afford to compete with each other because those who are seeking to do harm, to do violence to democracy, have been incredibly holistic in the way they approach this. Yes, they are after vote counting. There's no question about that. And there is nothing more fundamental to democracy than the idea of one person, one vote. And there is no threat greater than the threat to that fundamental principle of one person, one vote. And to, to make sure that that principle is safe, we have to make sure that people can trust that one person has cast one vote and that it's been counted accurately. So yes, it does start there. That, that, is, that is a fundamental starting place. But of course, they haven't stopped there. They're just as interested in voter suppression. And they are just as active in attacking voting rights. And, and you know, it was decided in America that the poll tax was not only illegal but immoral. Well, Wisconsin, as have many states, has passed a voter ID law. And those people who lack the proper photo identification if they if they don't if they don't have the ID, they have to have a birth certificate in order to get the the photo identification. If they don't have a, a birth certificate, depending on where you live, it's somewhere between eight and say thirty dollars to get a copy of your birth certificate. And if you're a woman and you no longer have your maiden name, you may need a copy of your marriage license to get the birth certificate to get the photo ID. The marriage license is going to be anywhere from eight to say twenty dollars. You know the poll tax that was, was outlawed during the civil rights era in today's dollar? In today's dollars was worth $10.64. Now how is what is happening today different than that poll taxation? Yeah, it's worse. But, but you know, they aren't stopping with assaulting voting rights. Because they also are seeking to rig elections through gerrymandered districts. A fundamental principle of democracy has to be that voters choose their representatives, not the other way around. And in state after state, it's the other way around. Representatives are handpicking their voters and, and creating districts that, that make it pretty much a foregone conclusion which party is going to control that seat. Now, if you have a secure vote and a secret vote, and you've jumped over the hurdles to exercise your voting rights, what 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 condition is our democracy in if you have no meaningful choices on the ballot because of, of that gerrymandering? And they haven't stopped there. Of course, they are also after rigging elections through money and politics. Now again, as I said, it has been decided in this country that poll taxation is illegal and indeed immoral. But what is the money and politics game but a candidacy tax? <laughs> Now, poll tax, poll taxation is wrong, but candidacy taxation is, is okay, because who in this room can afford to run for public office, for any major public office? Is, is that not another hurdle that has been erected to determine who can participate in our democracy and who cannot? We have to care about that, and we have to, we have to push back against that assault as well. And then, of course, there are the assaults on the media. Not only media ownership, and you all, you know, the first thing that springs to mind, of course, is Fox News. But there are so many others, the Franklin Center and all of these outfits that are, 
that are springing up around state capitals that are that are operated by the Franklin Center don't get as much attention as Fox News but they are every bit as sinister and and and, and you know it's not only media ownership but it's the media's addiction to money and politics and their unwillingness to really inform us about what's going on in, in election campaigns or in our government, you have to pay for that airtime. You have to pay for your message to, to, to be disseminated to the masses at, because of that addiction. That is a, a fundamental threat to our democracy. And then, of course, when all of these policies are put in place, they've then systematically gone about the business of stacking courts to make sure that th those laws are upheld as constitutional. Judicial reform has to be fundamental to our pursuit of a, of a renewed and invigorated and healthy democracy in America. So we have to be every bit as ambitious and every bit as holistic as the enemies of democracy if we are to be friends of democracy. We can't afford to reside in those silos and decide that there's only one dimension to this problem. We are in the fight of our lives. There's no doubt about that. But being from Wisconsin, I can offer, as in closing, these words of assurance that we can take comfort in in, in Wisconsin, but you all can relate to what, regardless of where you're from. Because we know, based on our own history here, that we don't face anything that hasn't been faced before and defeated. <coughs> You go back to the Gilded Age, the age of the robber barons. You know, there's a, there's a tourist trap in Wisconsin called Wisconsin Dells. You find some of the biggest water parks anywhere in America in Wisconsin Dells. Buried deep below all those tourist destinations is the story of our salvation. Because back in the 1800s, when Wisconsin Dells was known as Kilburn City, it was named for a man named Byron Kilburn, a railroad baron, who built a railroad spanning our state from Milwaukee to La Crosse to the Mississippi River and he crossed the Wisconsin River at what is now Wisconsin Dells. They named the town for him. That railroad was built on bribes. That railroad was, was built on political extortion. Because, because in Wisconsin at the time, bribing public officials was perfectly legal. And bribe public officials Byron Kilburn did. He, he, gave, he went to the state capitol and made over $275,000 worth of bribes to members of our state assembly to pass a land grant bill that gave him free land from Milwaukee to La Crosse. And they passed his bill. And he went back to the state senate, he made $150,000 or so in additional bribes to get the senate to pass his bill, and they did. And he went to the governor, Coles Bashford, and gave him 50,000 bucks to sign the bill into law, and he did. And they gave him free land that they seized from the people of Wisconsin. He built his railroad, and they named Wisconsin Dells for him. And if you drive in downtown Milwaukee to this day, you'll drive on Kilburn Avenue, named for Byron Kilburn. I tell that story not only because of the conditions it depicts, but because of the reaction it provoked. Legislators at the time who took all those bribes came to be known as the 40 Thieves. And in the next election, Wisconsin voters turned out of office every single one of the 40 Thieves. And Coles Bashford lost his next election by 118 votes to Alexander Randall, for whom Camp Randall Stadium is named, where the Badgers play their football. And that started a, a revolution in Wisconsin that bred the progressive movement and the rise to power of fighting Bob LaFollette. And in 1897, bribing public officials was outlawed. In 1897, and this, this state became a state in 1848. That means for the first half century of statehood, it was perfectly legal to bribe public officials. In 1897, that crooked practice ended. In 1905, corporate campaign contributions and corporate election spending were prohibited. And that led to perhaps the greatest legislative session in American history the 1911 session of the legislature. Workers' compensation was created. Child labor laws were enacted. Railroad regulation and, and, and railroad reform was passed. Insurance reform, the first state life insurance program anywhere in America, created right here in Wisconsin. A Corrupt Practices Act that built on the political protections. The first vocational, technical, and adult education system anywhere in America. We're in one of those today, 
The first one ever built in America was created by the 1911 legislature. They did that then because they were free to do that. They were free to lead. They were liberated from the legal bribery. We have come full circle. We're back in the conditions that those people faced. But what they taught us, what they taught us is that you can rise up against that kind of corruption and defeat it. We don't face anything today that hasn't been faced here before in Wisconsin. Wisconsin people know as well as anyone that we, we can defeat these forces and we will, but we'll only do that if we are every bit as ambitious and every bit as holistic as the enemies that we seek to defeat. Thank you. Mike grew up on a dairy farm here in Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, next speaker is Jean Shahin. Cindy Shahin. Cindy Shahin. Jean. Who the hell is Jean Shahin? Cindy, I'm sorry. Uh, I have a friend named Jean Shahin. Okay. Uh, and she is uh, the mother of, an, of someone who died in Iraq, a soldier who died in Iraq. Many of you know who she is. She's been an activist, an anti-war activist for many years. But what she wanted me to tell you is that she's got four great grand, great grandchildren. Yeah, not great. Not yeah. great. <laughs> she's got great. Really great. good grandchildren. Who are the smartest grandchildren anybody has got. Okay, and that's how she wanted to be introduced. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if anybody wants to get into Grandma Wars with me after the event, I, <laughs> I have pictures and proof that I have the cutest, smartest grandkids. So, you know, I'm sure yours are cute and smart too. Yeah, no, my, no, mine, Mimi. So anyway, um, wow, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak at this plenary. Ben and Victoria and Bob Fatrakis is actually responsible for me being here, so you can blame him or thank him, <laughs> whichever you want to do. Um, so, I haven't been too much involved in election protection. I know the difficulties we face uh, in elections, in electoral politics. Um, not just electoral politics, but the very mechanics of voting. And the thing I think we have a problem with in this country, and I don't know if it's here, or from Washington DC, or in Madison, or Sacramento, or wherever, is that they want to say, they, whoever we want to say they are, you know, Mike was talking about the robber barons. Mm. I wrote a book in 2009 dele delineating is that, did I say that right? Yes, yeah. indeed. Okay. <laughs> um, the class structure in this country. And I didn't break it down into income or wealth. I broke it down into the robber class versus the robbed class. And most of us here, I think, are in the robbed class. If you're in the robber class, Go to cindysheehansoapbox.com and give me a donation. But <laughs> if you're like me, um, the robber class is so much more than the 1%. The robber class are the institutions that oppress us. From the, the wealthy 1% to their government. You know, the governments aren't by the people and for the people, unless, unless those are the rich people and the corporations, right? <laughs> and not just the, the, the governments, the media, like Mike said, it's just not Fox News. You know, I once in a while tune, tune into what I like to call MSNBCIA <laughs> or CIANN. <laughs> you know, I like to tune into those to see what the propaganda is coming out of their mouths. And the military and the police, I'm going to say police, I almost said something else. The police <laughs> are part of this, of the robber class. 
1% of income owners couldn't lord it over us if they didn't have this support structure. If the military, police, and government, and uh, media weren't on their sides, right? I don't think they could rob us if that was. So we're still facing, like Mike said, it's come full circle. And we're facing those same challenges we faced over 100 years ago, and so on. So another thing that we make a mistake is that we are told they, the robber class, tell us that elections equal democracy. And that is not the case. Elections are, you don't even have to have elections to have a democracy. You can have democracy by consensus, right? Do we have a democracy even? No. You know, no, we don't. I mean, even in the, even in the, the uh, dictionary definition, we don't have it. But we were never set up as a democracy. We were set up as a representative republic. And the people that we go and think we're voting for to represent us do not. Like I said, they represent the robber class. They are the robber class many times. I ran against Nancy Pelosi in 2008 in San Francisco. Yes. And I mean, she's only gotten worse since I ran against her, if that's possible. And she is one of the wealthiest women in Congress. I, on the other hand, am one of the poorest people in California. And I ran against her, and you know, and now I'm going to run for governor in 14 of California and I can't you know last year I ran for vice president and it's not like I even like to run for office I hate it but you know I think we have to challenge the dominant two-party which is really just one party system and I never run against a Republican I, the Republicans also run like when I ran against Nancy Pelosi there was a Republican in, in running too I told her, I said, I'm not even running against you, I'm running against Pelosi. She says, I'm running against you. I'm like, well, fine, you know, fine with that. I beat her, by the way. I beat the Republican. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't beat Queen Robert Class, but I beat the Republican. And you cannot earn a living, like Mike said, if you're running for office. For one thing, it's a full-time job, but your campaign can't pay you. Your campaign can pay the manager, your campaign can pay, you know, the volunteer organizer, can pay the webmaster, can pay what? Whatever, you know, all the positions, but they can't pay the candidate. So how the hell are we supposed to pay our rent, feed ourselves, you know, whatever, if we're, you have to be independently wealthy. Or you have to be someone crazy enough to not care about her credit, like me, <laughs> to do this, right? So there's a lot of obstacles that the robber class put in front of us. Now in California, I don't know if you have it here in Wisconsin, but I don't think so. We have a top two primary system where, do you, you have it here? No. No, no. not yet. It's coming to a state near you. Where, you know, it's a, like an open primary and the top two vote getters move on to the general. Now, this was sold to us as it was going to be something that was going to, like, bring a renaissance of democracy to California. I don't even know how the hell they sold it to us that way. Because that doesn't make sense. When you limit the choices, you limit participation. And so, guess what? In 2012 was the first time we had elections based on this. In many districts, there were two Republicans or two Democrats running against each other. Not ever one third party or one independent got to go to the top two. So this is another thing that limits our choices. And many people look at, and I'm not talking about us here. Let's talk about the robber class. They want to tell us that there's no democracy in Iran because the, the Ayatollahs picked the candidates. Yeah. 
<laughs> so they so they get to vote on whoever the Ayatollahs tell them they can vote for. We have, I always say, we have the Ayatollahs of the American election system that pick our candidates to vote for. Wall Street, Big Pharma, the military industrial complex, banks, whoever they are. I know the right one is to call them the New World Order. Yeah. I always say I'd like to have a I'd like to have a builder burger, a vegan builder burger <laughs> with a new world side order of, <laughs> of sweet potato fries. But, but you know, I, and I don't think they have, they do have meetings. They call them like the G20, GA, Bohemian NATO, Grove. Bohemian Grove, uh, World Bank. You know, they do have meetings. Yeah, and, but I think there's some kind of general agreement about which candidates are going to further their agenda, right? And so I think the Ayatollahs of American politics choose for us, especially who's going to get to run for president in the Democrat and Republican sphere, Congress, the Senate. People are always like, we need to recall Senator X. I'm like, we need to abolish the Senate. The Senate is, we need to abolish all 100 of them. Like they did in Venezuela, uh, the elitist uh, branch. They're all elite, but that's the most elite branch. I guess nobody here really agrees with me about abolishing the Senate. <laughs> so I have how many? I, you just hold up one finger and said I have two minutes. I was like, Which finger? <laughs> it's really confusing me. <laughs> oh wait, hold on, yeah, that's two. <laughs> I didn't have my glasses on. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't really have much more to say except I will always try to confront the party of Wall Street, which is the Democrats and the Republicans. I will always try to confront the party of war. You know, the war party has a left wing and a right wing, and they're all working towards this perpetual war. And, you know, we can go and vote, and someone said, you know, vote for the Democrat, vote for the Republican. If you vote for the Democrat, you're at least telling the Republican that you don't like their agenda. But if you don't vote for either one, you can tell both of them that you don't like that agenda. And voting, and I think going to vote, and sometimes it can be very, very compromised, unless you're voting in Venezuela, where they have almost 100% election integrity there. But if you go to vote in the United States, like was said, there's a real chance that your vote is not going to go to where you wanted it to go. But at least you can cast a vote against the system. We, we might not win, but there's a danger of that, of us you know, really getting into office. But at least we can say that there is, oh my god, what would I do if I was in Congress right now? I, they'd give me a corner office in some basement, you know, shove me to the side, and I wouldn't get up and say my esteemed colleague from anywhere. <laughs> I'd just be that asshole from Arizona or wherever. So, so anyway, but we have to, and voting is just not democracy. Getting out in the streets working together in movements, making more, diver uh, encourage diversity. If there's diversity, if there's youth, if there's people of color, if the demographics of your movement look more like the demographics of the country, that's when we're going to have a relevant and very successful movement. Thank you. Next speaker will be Jonathan Simon, who's the co-founder of the Election Defense Alliance, the EDA, an organization that's been working since around 2006, but started around uh, right after the 2004 elections, realizing that something went wrong in Ohio. 
There's a lot of people who have been doing forensics and have written books and have written many uh, uh, articles about what happened in the last four or five election cycles and how they've been stolen. Jonathan Simon's recent book, the Code Red, Code Red Computerized is, Election Theft in the New is, American Century. And Jonathan's going to talk to you a little bit about election integrity from this perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, and thanks for all the organizers. You know, I, I don't often speak from notes, but I, this topic has so many tendrils. And so I have, a, I have a half a page of notes, and that's the good news. And the bad news is that it's fractal. And <laughs> so everything just sort of leads off to everything else. And I'll try to make it coherent. And I'll just try to start with an immediate experience. Just before this uh, plenary, we had a hand-counted paper ballot pilot project, a, a workshop, where we got to actually participate in a mock hand count of paper ballots from counties in California. And I, believe it or not, I've been, I've been doing election integrity for over a decade, and I've never counted a single ballot. And I gotta say, it was, it was a blast, sitting down with people I didn't know, and listening to instruction from people who sort of, you know, who could tell us what to do, never, you know, learning on the, on the spot, and doing my best, as we all were, to, to count these ballots accurately and fairly, cooperating as a team, this is what democracy looks like. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Fuck yeah. This is democracy. Yeah. And I said to myself, this, this, is, yeah. this is great. I could do this. And who wouldn't want to do this? Come out after an election, sit down, and take part in the bone structure of this country and this democracy. And so, you know, that's exciting. And then reality sets in. And the reality is we're so damn, damn, damn far away from that becoming the reality. We're, we're a long way. Can't wave a magic wand. Can't wish upon a star. And if anything, I think in many ways we're, we're going speedily in reverse. And I'm not sure I agree with Mike that it's been this bad ever before. I mean, I wasn't around for the robber barons. I wasn't around for the internment of the Japanese or for the, what they did with the, you know, the German Americans during World War I and all the various manifestations of the security state. But something feels rotten at the core that's going on now because we are blessed, cursed, with this explosion of technology. And the bastards are right on it. Right. Like maggots, that fast, to make sure that it becomes part of a system of control. Because we are the enemy. The public is the enemy. It's a big shift in the sort of political dynamic. Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal, that's what we grew up with. Now it's something else. Now it really is the 1% as Cindy was alluding to, the robbers and the rob. And they were a very small group, and they could never get elected legitimately, ever. Right, right. Yes. Yep. So you got to pull out all the stops. And Mike was alluding to some of the stops. Cindy was alluding. You know what the stops are. Finance, the media, elections themselves, and the counting process. You know, sometimes it just seems surrealistic to me that we're in this place. And I have to remind myself that it only seems surrealistic because it, it should be so different. And it only seems surrealistic if you were born into democracy, if you assume that it's your birthright, and if you forget about history. Then this all this corporate takeover business seems surrealistic. How can it be happening? But if you trace the patterns of history, you find that democracy is <coughs> fragile. And power has a way of trying to accrete and consolidate itself, as it is doing now. But it's doing it with the benefits of some of the most seductive inventions and gifts that we've ever seen. Beware the Greeks bearing gifts, the iPod, the iPhone, all these things that are all part of 
information exchange, which is such a beautiful thing, and so, so vulnerable to corruption. We have to have, if we're going to find our way out of this somehow, and if on the day the 99% figures out that it's the 99% and goes to vote, they actually have their votes counted and prevail. Because if we're not talking revolution, then it's going to be the ballot box. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. Revolution. And, you know, if we're going to talk revolution, then let's talk revolution. But if we're still talking representative government and working from the place that we're at, then we've got to have three things. We've got to have alliance and cooperation from every cause that has a stake in observable vote counting. No more I was just at the TPP rally, and I, I tried to sort of wheeze my way in to speak, and uh, the, the roster was, was filled up, which I understand, that's, that's fine. But I listened to a lot of people speak about taking back power. And you know, the big question mark goes on over here. How the hell are we supposed to take back power? Good question. If we can't get our votes counted, yeah. if they're disenfranchising to get to maybe 15% away, and then they're sending out Vote Wednesday robocalls and flyers to get to maybe 8% away, and then they're rigging the rest. I mean, all these different means, which to a true believer, are all justified because the ends, whether it's a true believer or a pure player, somebody who just wants to see if they can manipulate or game the system, there are people that sort of rise to these positions or get into these positions and we've allowed them to go there because we've allowed the privatization and the corporatization of the entire electoral system. So we've got to have alliance from all the people that this is destroying destroying their agendas, whether it's environmental, unions, economic, education, you name it. And I'm not seeing that because not a single person at TPP said how we're going to take back power, said anything about what happens when we go to the ballot box to vote the bastards out. So we've got to have that. We've got to have background pressure and big megaphones. And this is where it's anathema, it's sacrilege. Celebrities count in this culture of ours. I hate to say it, but one good word from Oprah or Matt Damon or Bruce Springsteen, a tweet, something, it brings focus, it brings attention. We, we have a message, not too many people outside of our choir are hearing our message. We can use whatever help we can get. So to get to people who have Twitter followings, I got a Twitter following of 43. <laughs> Greg, you probably beat me by a few. There are people with Twitter followings of, I don't know, 10 million or some big number. One word from them about Greg's book, Cindy's project, my book, NEIC, and a lot of people will become focused. We need that. And we need something that will sell. And this is where I would love to see hand-counted paper ballots. Boy, would I love to see. I had fun. We could all, we owe this to our democracy. This is a duty. We have rights in a democracy. Don't you think we should have some duties and responsibilities as well? And one of them might be every year or so, or with primary elections, you know, maybe twice a year, three times a year, participating in the actual counting of the votes. Is that really asking too much? That would be a beautiful thing. Yes. Unfortunately, It's a hard sell. We're not designing a democracy from scratch. We're not designing a republic from scratch. We're not writing a constitution from scratch. We've got a system that's pretty damn entrenched. Election administrators, 140,000 places all over the country that want to do things a certain way. What can we give them that they'll sort of, even if we kind of have to finesse it through a little bit, hide the ball, but that they will sort of say, yeah, okay, we can do that and that would be sufficiently deterrent to stop the big, 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 big picture theft of American elections. I, I'm, I'm beginning to sort of warm up to audits and risk limiting audits and things that you can actually get election administrators and legis legislative uh, people to approve. 
No election system is going to be perfect. We don't need it to be perfect. There's noise in an election system. When you're counting lots of big numbers, things will happen. We don't care about little things that happen. You know, a vote here, I'm sorry, count every vote is cast in the land of Oz, but not in the real world. But if, the, if it is not coming from a deliberate, manipulative intent, then those things kind of, they work out. They work out over time. You're not going to steal a country. You're not even going to steal a state or a town through miscounting one vote here or miscounting one vote there. But if you set the memory card zero counters to plus 100 minus 100 on 1,000 machines, yeah. Yeah. and nobody can tell because it's three lines of code out of 500,000 lines of code on a memory card that is never, ever open to examination, well, you certainly can steal a country that way. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what we've seen happen, along with disenfranchisement and along with Citizens United. You need a lot of weapons if you're the 1%. One man. Okay. Try Take a deep breath. <laughs> there is a, there is a enormous psychological impediment in our cause that probably doesn't exist in some of the other causes. And that is this vision of America, and it's part of our individual and collective pride as a democracy, as the beacon of democracy. What we're saying is happening is just so disturbing that a lot of people will shut down. The closer to the corridors of power they are, the more they're going to shut down. So one of the things we've learned the hard way is that even though we've come up with all sorts of numerical, circumstantial, statistical evidence of fraud, it doesn't make a very good elevator speech. Fortunately, the machines are so damned vulnerable, just think about the memory card exploit, you know? And there, there are many more, and that's not even getting into internet voting, and the machines that are networked, that, are, that, that, have, that have servers out of state in Tennessee, counting the election in Ohio, open to anybody. The vulnerability argument is very, very, very strong. And so there are arguments we can make. We've got to pick them well. We've got to join together. We've got to make it so that if there is a Coles Bashford, that bastard governor of Wisconsin, and you know there is <laughs> in today's world, that we can vote the bastard out of office. And all of them, or enough of them, so that the will of the public is reasonably translated in this representative form of government into the policies and the appointments and the governance by the people who are elected to do that job. Thank you. This is a great crowd. Thank you very much all for coming. Our next speaker is, our next speaker is one of the heroes of the election integrity movement, Bob Fatrakis, who's a professor in Ohio, who was one of the people who exposed a lot of the stealing of the election in Ohio in, the, in 2004. He's written books, he's made speeches, films, he's been involved in many fronts, including legal battles uh, in, where, you know, he's fought the election the election frauds in many ways in 2004, more lately in 2012, and I hope that you're as inspiring as our last speakers, and I know you will be. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I'll uh, be inspiring, but uh, my message is uh, we should take this challenge on in uh, post-constitutional America and we should make it fun to expose these war criminals, these people that are shredding our Constitution, and that my vision is one of that, those great days in history. It's like, oh, they'll never get rid of the East German Stasi. They're too vicious. They have files on everyone. And then I looked up and there was a million people surrounding the building as they dove out the windows and went inside and liberated the people's documents and found that that spy apparatus can be destroyed by people power. So I think every day, you know, since we know they have carrier IQ on our, our, our phones, 
Uh, right. Is that uh, I think every every day we should say hi to the NSA. But we're watching you. You think you're watching us? We're coming for you. So. <laughs> This is post-constitutional America. I mean, let's look at some of the analysis, right? A group of far-right uh, religious fundamentalists uh, in the 1980s came to power uh, with uh, what was called a useful idiot, Ronald Wilson Reagan, uh, representing the corporate forces. Uh, and in that uh, situation, what has now happened why they've had to move to post-constitutional America and why we're in the fight of our life is because we won the cultural war. The right-wingers came in. It's because they didn't like women owning their own bodies. They've lost that war even though they're getting really desperate now as they're going down to defeat. And that they were, they were pro-alcohol only for sacraments and NyQuil at night. Uh, <laughs> They didn't like marijuana. We won that war. Medical marijuana, Colorado, Washington. The environmental war, we won that. Gay, lesbians, uh, bisexual, transgender. We won that war. We, the counterculture has prevailed. We're a diverse people. We're a tolerant people. We're a peaceful environmental uh, people who believe in sustainability. So what do they have left? The corporatists. And we know from Mussolini who defined corporatism uh, as fascism. The two words he used, right? Uh, what is fascism? Corporatism and illiberalism. Capitalism. We're liberal, diverse, tolerant, and now we've got to go after those corporate forces because that's all they have left. These artificial entities, these, you know, oh, we're persons. I mean, they're vampires that are sucking the very substance out of our communities. There's nothing wrong with Detroit that their patterns of investment and disinvestment didn't kill that city. It's American exceptionalism. There is no Labor Party. There is no Socialist Party. There is no People's Party who said, Build jobs in factories in an industrial center instead of going to communist China and exploiting poor people there. Right. We're for sustainability in China, sustainability in Mexico, a living wage for all people on this planet. Yeah. So when they go to suck the life out of Detroit, we stand with them. Who's the only company that's built an auto factory in Detroit that has one in the city is Fiat, which bought up Chrysler. Because in Europe, they actually build factories in industrial centers. So in order to keep us from realizing uh, how these artificial zombie vampire enemies, and I think that's why we have so many movies on them, because every single day they suck our substance out of this. What they've done is the following, right? They've destroyed, we used to be in the, in the 60s when I was growing up, we were proud, right? Evil countries, the, the Soviets tortured people. We didn't, right? In our constitution we were the first, you know, post-medieval nation in the Eighth Amendment, no cruel and unusual punishment. And then they came, Dick Cheney and David Addington, and said, right, it's not really torture. And John Yoo, unless a major body organ fails. So the very principles of Nuremberg, the very principles that we pushed in the covenant against torture, they made us a torturous people. And we reject that. We reject it, we refuse yeah. to tolerate it, and we know that torture is torture. And then they came after, right, our Fourth Amendment. Uh, how did they do that? Again, it's David Addington, uh, who works for Dick Cheney, right? He writes a secret memo that no one's seen because it's secret. <laughs> and that secret memo allows people to secretly go to a secret court and issue secret warrants against us that we can't quash or challenge because it's 
secret. Right. We're saying none of that is secret. That's this right. is still America. We still have probable cause. Let them articulate why they're coming after us. That is the Constitution. Yeah. Many of you in here are vets. You swore oaths to preserve and defend the U.S. Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Let's get them. Let's get them. We're not afraid of them. They're spreading the Constitution. Let's go after them. And they've destroyed the First Amendment, them and their project Mockingbird, right? Where they bought up, the, uh, the New York Times recently admitted, oh yeah, we got caught up in that, you know, the CIA came in and hired at 40, 50 newspapers reporters. We have and we will continue to use the media, to use the internet, to use the digital revolution to link up as we're doing here to report the real facts of this country. We don't support drone wars. We don't support a president on Tuesday with some strange matrix coming in and going, I've got to kill a wedding party today in Yemen. I've got to kill U.S. citizens. We believe in due process. Right. We are in the fight of our life because these are universal and truly American values in the finest sense. And these people are, and let's use the F word, they're corporatists and they're fascists, yeah. and it starts right here. Future historians are going to record that we gathered here today, and we said the fight back begins here and now yeah. against yeah. Walker, against yeah. Governor Kasich, yeah. against all these stooges yeah. that worship allegiance to artificial corporate enemies. Remove their charters. Take back Come America. On. Yeah. Thank you. Come on. Yeah. 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 Stein was a 2012 candidate for the Green Party. She was a presidential candidate. And she now serves as president in the shadow Green government. All right. So I'm going to speak from uh, that America where there is a constitution and that America where there is democracy that other America, a virtual America. And in that America, uh, we actually do have a government of, by, and for the people. We call it the Green Shadow Cabinet. Come on, and just to give a taste of what democracy feels like, I just want to tell you some of the things that we together have accomplished in the Green Shadow Cabinet's America and the, the government of, by, and for the people that we together have created. And if we had a real democracy and real hand-counted paper ballots and money out of politics and a free media that actually allowed full and fair coverage of all candidates, these are the kinds of things that we would have right now. And I think in order to get there, in order to get election integrity, in order to get voting reform and instant runoff voting and uh, proportional representation and the things that really represent who we are and what we feel and what we need and what we want right now, we have to couple democracy reforms with economic reforms, with health care reforms, with housing reforms, because the reality is that most people are really struggling day to day to keep their heads above water. So unfortunately, it falls to us who have the time, the wherewithal, 
to really be looking after, to be the uh, monitors uh, of the technology of our democracy. This needs to be a mass movement. And in order for it to be a mass movement, we really have to bring our movements together. So I want to just run through some of the things that we accomplish. We've already accomplished in this virtual world where we have a democracy. Bradley Manning is a free man. Okay. His sentence has been reduced to time already served, and he's a hero. <laughs> He's a hero for telling the truth about U.S. war crimes, about our complicity in the war crimes of other countries, and about the nest of lies, the snake pit of lies that our, uh, our Secretary of State and our Foreign Service Department has become. So we owe a debt of gratitude to Bradley Manning for telling the truth to the American people. As we owe... A debt of gratitude to Edward Snowden. Yeah. And to Julian Assange, who makes the lie. In the, this democracy that we deserve, that we should have, we have in the virtual world right now, we have health care as a human right we have Medicare for all. So if you have medical bills, if you have medical concerns, forget about it. They're taken care of. You are now covered nice. through Medicare for all. Just try that on. See how that feels to have health care as a human right. It de doesn't depend on your job. It doesn't depend on your labor contract. You have health care as a human right. If you owe a debt, a college debt, it's gone. Yes. You've been emancipated. Yes. How does that feel? Um, we've cut the military budget in half. So we have the money that we need. And we've created a Green New Deal so that we can create the jobs that we need right now for everyone. If you're out of work, if you're working a part-time, a temporary job, no worries. You now, instead of going down to an unemployment office, you go down to the employment office okay. and you get a full-time living wage job. <laughs> and you do it making your community healthy and sustainable Hallelujah. and just. You don't have to sell your soul to the fossil fuels or the nuclear companies or the financial service companies. We have good jobs to create good and healthy communities, nor to Walmart, exactly, <laughs> nor to the fast food industry. Yeah. Um, so we can not only create jobs, we can also end the climate crisis right now. In fact, a uh, study just put out by Stanford University looked at the state of New York as a microcosm. And what they found is that we can get to 100% clean renewable energy, wind, water, and sun by the year 2030, and it pays for itself. That transition they tell us we can't afford, it turns out it pays for itself because of all of the fossil fuel, pollution-related heart attacks, strokes, asthma, cancer, learning disabilities, diabetes, and all the rest that are related to this fossil fuel economy and transportation system and food system that we have. We can go green, it pays for itself. There's no reason not to go there right now. That's right. And as part of the Green New Deal, we call for democracy reforms because there will be no getting of these transformational policies while the predators continue to run the show in yeah. Congress, in the White House, and in the voting booth and the voting machines. Yeah. So we, need, we call for a democracy agenda. 
which includes a constitutional right for everyone to vote. You well, don't need an ID card, and that can't be used in order to disenfranchise everyone who needs and deserves a right to vote. Yeah. We will get money out of politics. Political campaigns will be funded publicly by public money so that the votes of our elected officials cannot be bought, period. Money yep. is out, people are back in. Yep. And we can afford public financing of our elections the minute we make media free for all qualified candidates who are on the ballot. that we can't afford public financing. We passed it in Massachusetts by a two to one margin and the legislature, which was about 85% Democratic, repealed it saying that, oh no, there was no way we could possibly afford to pay the costs of elections. You know, if we can't afford to pay the costs of elections, we have a real problem on our hands. But we can get rid of that problem by eliminating the cost up front, by making media free. That's where the cost of elections comes in. They've usurped the public airwaves. We need to take them back. These are all basically self-engineered problems. They've been engineered by the predatory political elite. They create these problems yep. for which they offer themselves as the only solutions. Mm -hmm. Well, we say we're going to just get rid of those problems to start with, and then we can get rid of that political elite that's pretending that they are the solution. Yep. <laughs> And of course, we're calling for hand-counted paper ballots so that we can truly uh, have meaningful votes and votes that are real and elections that have integrity. Yeah. 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 And we're calling for equitable access to the ballot. Uh, in the campaign that I just ran, we spent uh, the first ten months really just getting on the ballot and then we had about five weeks to then run a political campaign so we need to make election access, ballot access equitable as we need to make equitable our debates. We should not be in the business of locking up grandmotherly uh, presidential candidates and strapping them to chairs for eight hours, wow. handcuffing us to metal, chair, to metal chairs, surrounded by Secret Service, Homeland Security, and militarized police, because we do represent that big a threat. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I'll just end saying the biggest myth out there uh, is that we don't have the power to change this. Uh, as Alice Walker says, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. One out of every two Americans now, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, is either in poverty or heading towards it and very close. That's half of all Americans. That is a lot of people. Add that up with the 39 million students who are indentured servants because there is no way out for them. According to the Department of Labor, nine out of ten jobs coming online over the next decade are low-wage, insecure jobs that do not pay college wages, they don't require a college degree, so all those students are basically stuck where they are. Half of those jobs coming online now, according to the Department of Labor, don't even require a high school degree or pay high school wages. So get ready, you know, hold on to your hat. What we're seeing now is just a taste of what's to come. But the message here is that if we broaden our movement, 
This is a movement for democracy and election integrity. It's also a movement for economic justice, for jobs for everyone, for living wages, for health care as a human right, for education that's free from pre-kindergarten through college, through a college degree, for ending college debt, for, putting, for breaking up the big banks and putting the Wall Street crooks into jail. Yeah. And for ending the climate crisis as part of how we jumpstart that clean, renewable, green energy yeah. economy that puts everyone back to work. Yeah. We can solve those problems at the same time, and by the way, that happens to make wars for oil obsolete, yeah. enabling yeah. us to cut that military <laughs> budget in half, which it should be cut anyhow. So we've got a win-win-win-win here. And the only missing ingredient is for us to take ourselves seriously and to take the responsibility that we have very seriously. Our democracy is in our hands, our economy is in our hands, our climate uh, and the future of the planet is really in our hands. Nobody's going to do it for us. It's we who are going to do it. This is the time for the politics of courage. All that stuff about, oh, you don't dare to vote for an independent third party candidate because you'd be throwing away your vote. It's exactly the opposite. If you vote for more of the same, you're going to get more of the same. That's the definition. of courage. This has been a wonderful session and a wonderful meeting. Uh, I have asked one of my partners in the Green Shadow Cabinet, uh, Richard Monhay, to come and say a few words as well. And Richard is the Secretary of Labor and really represents who it is that must be our partners going forward. And I mean everyday working people, I mean immigrants who are essentially citizens of the world, which we all are together. This is about getting out of our silos, getting together, because the minute we do that, we have a movement for people, peace, and the planet, which is unstoppable. Let's show them what it means. Richard Mormhay is going to speak. We've invited him to speak. He'll ask us. And Richard is the Vice President um, of Workers United, the SEIU. It's a union that's in the forefront of fighting the attack on workers in the Midwest. He's been organizing low-wage workers. He's worked on a number of political causes. He first came to an awakening of his political role when he was shot by sheriffs following the Chicano moratorium. He's worked with, he's worked with Texas farm workers, the IBEW, steel workers, United, workers United. He helped create a union leadership school where rank and file members take part in creating a political roadmap for the union. He's long been active in the fight for immigrant rights, and he's joined the move to amend leadership team and is Secretary of Labor for the Green Shadow Government. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, thank you, um, and thank you, Jill, for offering me the opportunity to address this, and I feel very um, humbled, number one, with the panel, and number two, with the position of Secretary of Labor. Um, I, feel, I, feel, I, feel, I feel slightly underqualified, uh, but I think it's important for uh, me to state that I come from one of the organizations that is perhaps one of the most undemocratic organizations in the country, and that is the union structure. Uh, despite uh, it being set up to be one of the most democratic and uh, electing uh, representative democracy, in fact, it's the exact opposite. And certainly over the last 10 years, uh, or maybe 20 years, things have changed a little bit. I happen to be a part of, uh, in 1994, 1995, the formation of the Labor Party. Our union was a part of that and funded it, and we were one of the last organizations to leave. In our experience in uh, forming that Labor Party, it Im immediately polarized into a bunch of different camps. 
But I noticed three principal camps. One was, is whether or not the Labour Party would be a party of the left. And then the second one, it would, be, would it be a party dominated by the trade unions with a total trade union agenda? And then the third was a real Labour Party, a party of the working class. Employed, unemployed, union, not in union, incorporating the entire uh, uh, process of people that are disenfranchised in this country in one way or another. We were, un we were unsuccessful, and there's a lot of reasons to look at why. And not only that, after that, the unions are now more entrenched inside the Democratic Party than ever, and yeah. there's less democracy than ever. Yes. And the fight and the battle that we have for democracy is in every single institution that exists. Yes. And there's a reason for that. And there's a reason why we can organize our way out of this. But declaring what's wrong, we're good at it. Mm -hmm. We've done it, we're doing it, and we gotta continue to do more. We gotta become more concise, because we can win over a lot of people conceptually. Not with uh, speeches, but with ideas, simple ideas. But the first thing we gotta do is recognize that there's not enough of us that there's a broad section of society that is not a part of the climate movement, that is not a part of the union movement, that is not a part of the various formations that we have in society that is organizing. I, uh, one of the examples uh, from the brother in Ohio is that in Ohio, the Democratic Party and the main plans to win over Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Toledo, and that's the formula for winning mm -hmm. Ohio. Mm -hmm. I have members in Norwalk, Ohio. I have members in Finley and Fremont, yeah. in other park sections in smaller towns and rural areas of Ohio. And the Democratic Party never goes there. And when we do union walks, we don't do union walks in those communities. Our members are sent to Cleveland, Toledo, and Cincinnati. Yeah. That is not a process where we're engaging communities and members that are not a part of the conversation. We leave them to the Republicans. I, I, in, in Wisconsin, during the Obama campaign, we did work up on the Ohio River and the old, not the Ohio River, sorry, the Fox River, the old paper mills and all that, the old steel workers, conservative as can be. Old union members, absolutely Republican. Yeah. We won that area. Things can be done, but the question is, how are we gonna do it? We must dig down. I look at our members more as territorial rather than as union. And why do I say territorial? Because one time I walked in and got an assignment in Norwalk, Ohio. One shop, four plants, 500 members. Another workplace across the street, 500 members, three shifts, three plants. A thousand members in Norwalk, Ohio a Republican mayor. How is that possible? Not only that, there was UAW and other construction trades in the area. How is it possible that that happened? We're not organized. We allowed that to happen. But if I could organize at least 500 of those thousand members to organize 10 people, five from their family, five of their neighbors, we could take everything over. Why didn't we do it? Why don't we do it? So we have developed a leadership <coughs> process for internal uh, purposes of the union because we want to be a member-driven organization, not a staff-driven organization, and there's a difference. And whenever you go to demonstrations and you see unions there, see if there's members or staff there. Yeah. Right. And you'll, you'll know that. But that's true of everything that we do. We go to the people that we know will go there. We don't reach out to the broader group of people. We don't try to process and convince them. And that's what we need to do. We need to turn every one of us into an organizer of 10 people. And then those 10 people each organize 10 people. We need to begin the process of spreading our word and not, no longer talking to each other. 
we're good at talking to each other and we're good at arguing with each other about right. socialism and the trade union movement, why it failed, why it didn't fail, Andy Stern and this and that, and we're experts at looking back. I, I had the opportunity to spend some time when I was with the steelworkers with Ed Sadlowski and discussing what happened in his campaign. We got very close. I was close with Joe Romano, his right-hand man in his campaign. And, you know, we, I spent a lot of time talking about how he went around all over the country. He had to carry gun to go to local union meetings because the international would organize against him. Uh, that was great. That, and he damn near won an insurgency campaign in an international union. They changed the Constitution after that, right? It can never be done ever again. It would be too difficult. But that's democracy. Well, we have to counter that. And, you know, where I have members in a city or a town, they should dominate that conversation. They should organize to dominate that conversation. It's my responsibility and my union to create those kinds of leaders. But it's your responsibility as well to create more leaders. If you do not create more leaders, you are not a leader. Mm. Yeah. 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 And we have to proliferate that idea and concept and model of organizing and continue to develop more models of organizing. But we need to be able to win people over with a concise, simple program. I have joined the Move to Amend because I believe that that blocks our ability to change the laws, mm -hmm. to get elected. So let's fight to do something about it. Let's politicize the community to do something about it. Whether Move to Mend is actually the one, but it's part of a current to try to reestablish some semblance of democracy in this country by moving money out of the process. But secondly, after the experience in the Labor Party, I was asked to join the Green Party and to join the cabinet. And I know that we cannot accomplish this without a new party. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to put my effort, my time, and my resources to building that party. And, and the fight with you, to argue with you, and other people about what that process should be. Mm -hmm. And we should argue. Good. We should disagree. Because we need to hammer out a program that unifies us where we act as one. Yeah. And we teach our communities, our families, to act as one, under one program that incorporates the needs of every aspect of the climate change, of the environmental movement, of the struggle of African Americans for equality, the struggle for immigration reform, the struggle for equality for Latinos in this country and all the other ethnic groups that have been isolated and marginalized and create a unified economic relative equality in this country through an organized program. Thank you. Yeah. Hard to follow up these candidates. <laughs> candidates, yeah. candidates, yeah. candidates and speakers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Candidates, candidates, Our please. next speaker is Greg Palast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine Harris, you all know who she was. <laughs> She called Greg Palace twisted and maniacal. Yeah! I figured that's a good speaker to have. It was, on, it was Palace who uncovered Harris's purge of black voters as felons in the 2000 presidential elections. Palace has investigated election theft for BBC television, Harper's and Rolling Stone. He is the author of several books. New York Times bestsellers, including The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, and his current bestseller, Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, How to Steal an Election in 90 Easy Steps. This is about how Greg Palace investigates Carl Rove and the Koch brothers gang and their buck buddies. And with that, I give you Greg Palace. Woo! I'm going to give up some of my time.
on my speaking time because I'd like you to see a little bit of a film that we're going to be making together. And so if we could turn off the lights and just hit it and uh, let it run a few seconds after it turns black, though. January 20, 2017. President Sarah Palin's inauguration is marred by protests over the barring of over six million black, Hispanic, and student voters in the November election. It all began back in June of 2013 when the United States Supreme Court decided to take the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Dr. King's Dream Act, and rip it up. Within two hours of the court ruling, the state of Texas changed its voter ID laws, blocking 400,000 U.S. citizens from casting ballots. Supreme Court ruling striking down that key section of the 1965 Voting Rights Act has prompted some new moves in Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, and North Carolina. Within days, the state of Florida began removing 181,000 Hispanic Americans from the voter rolls, calling them illegal aliens. Alabama, Virginia, Mississippi began to hunt for dark-skinned voters and ways to eliminate their rights. Fifty years after Dr. King's dream speech, Americans are once again asking, will black and brown people have the right to vote? Not in South Carolina. Every election in our state now requires photo ID before you vote. In total, 5,900,000 citizens lost the right to vote. Someone should have warned us. One, two, three. And someone did. Catherine Harris calls Greg Palace twisted and maniacal. I, no, I'm not. I'm a reporter. From the reporter who busted the Florida election theft stories for BBC Television, Democracy Now! and Rolling Stone. And this is Greg Palast at the Republican National Committee. Greg Palast is back with an experiment in citizen journalism. This kind of guerrilla journalism doesn't work for me. With a new film based on his New York Times bestseller, Billionaires and Ballot Bandits. Palace busts open the story of how the election of 2016 will be stolen and who's stealing it. My brother and I are job creators and because of that we're also candidate creators. Including the secret tape recording of a man named Koch and revealing the Koch brothers hidden hand in the XL Keystone pipeline. We're not representing the United States. They're representing coke oil and they're representing the oil industry, which is in the midst of a hostile takeover of our country. They're literally trying to turn this country into a third world petrostate and a, a corporate kleptocracy. From Florida to Ohio to California, Palace gets to the bottom of vote theft shenanigans. I didn't know when you put, when you fill in the name that you had to put a bubble in. Mom, it said you had to put it in the fill in the bubble. I'm sorry. We could look to other people that we paid $4 million to purchase this election for the Republican Party, Mr. Roberts. Billionaires and Ballot Bandits, the theft of 2016. Produced by you. Hi, I'm Robert F. Kennedy Jr. For many years, Greg Palast and I have been writing about and investigating voter suppression. Voter suppression is real, it's happening, it's a crime, it can happen to you, and there's something that you can do about it. Make your tax-deductible contribution to produce this film. Go right now to www.gregpalace.com. Let me show you what I mean, I'm anti-republican and democratic. If they sell you blow up buildings, Mom? Actually, you can't, you can't. The, the elite does what the elite do, and we have to be, we have to learn to be smarter than the elite. Unless you want to sing Hail to the Thief in 2016, oh, man. go to gregpalast.com. We have elections like those run in countries where the guys in charge are, you know, colonels in mirrored sunglasses. <laughs> I'd like to pick up for um, Vicki Collier who put in the sweat uh, with, um, you know, with uh, Ben Patchnick here. Please, a big up for uh, Vicki. Yeah. Uh, 
the gold star mom, Cindy Sheehan's worth your weight in gold. Marta Steele here is, by the way, a great uh, investigator. Well, that yeah. maybe Kennedy from PDA, please. These are very important buildings. Who's on the chain? Great to file the author, go stand. Uh, Jonathan Simon, uh, EDA, that's uh, who's trying to save our lives. And, and Mike, uh, let's talk about your silos. In November of 2000, in fact, I got in trouble because as in London working for BBC TV, I get a couple discs at my desks, and they are the names of the felons, the criminals, and their do wells that were removed from the Florida voter rolls for the election of 2000. So I cracked those discs, went through them, and found names like um, like Mrs. Uh, Bobby Moore, who was removed because uh, Robert Moore of Ohio had committed a crime, <laughs> and he committed the crime in 2014. Oh, so Catherine Harris could Jeez. reach into the future and uh, and find the bad guys. There are 56,000 names. You might not be you'd be shocked to find out. I bet that most of them were had B L A next to their names. Black. Oh Almost all were D for I don't know what party that is. And um, and everyone. I asked the, U you know, I, the uh, Attorney General of Florida, so how many of these ne'er-do-wells, you go to jail if you're a felon illegally voting, how many did you arrest, how many of these felons have you grabbed, after all you got their names and addresses, he says, well yeah, we're, I looked at the list and we found six, wow. but actually probably not, just probably none, and there were no convictions, 50, but 56,000 people Mostly African Americans lost their vote. George Bush won the presidency in Florida by 537 votes. Oh. It was a racial coup d'état. Okay, and then okay, there. All right, give them one. 2004. I get a bunch of emails from Karl Rove's office. He sent me his confidential email. Oh, like he didn't mean to. He sent it to georgewbush.org, which is a, he meant to send it to georgewbush.com. They went to .org, owed by my friend uh, John Wooden. <laughs> it was a mistake, you know, and um, it said return it to him, you know, don't the confidential return them, and so I, I did. I looked at them first, okay. <laughs> Thousands of names, cage, and they call them caging lists. Here's another caging list. And I looked at the caging list, and I went to the Republican Party and said, what's all these names here? What's this caging list? They said, oh, it's uh, our donors. And I said, but this entire list is from the homeless shelter in State Street, Jacksonville. <laughs> what do you do, let them lick the plates at the $500 plate dinners? Like, what do you mean? They're like, okay. And there was another list. Here's what they were doing. They were sending letters. Caging is this. Bobby Kennedy and I were investigating this for Rolling Stone. They were sending letters to 700,000 voters that they, that, and when those letters came back, when those letters came back undelivered, they would challenge your vote and say these are fake voters from fake addresses. They sent them to homeless shelters. They sent them to uh, to um, apartment buildings in Miami of Jewish voters who they knew would not be around when they sent the letters in August because there's stonebirds are going north. They were going after the elderly of Zion. And they were going after black students at black colleges sending letters and another group. Another group. Because the race of a voter in Florida is written right on the registration form. They went after the dark-skinned voters who at the U.S. Naval Base at Jacksonville, the U.S. Marines serving overseas who they knew when the letter came, because it says do not forward, would go back to them. They challenged the rights of minority Marines to vote in 2004. Okay? And you know, go to Iraq, lose your vote, or maybe your life, and, um, and the mission accomplished. 2004. That's not all. Um, we think you're done with purge. You saw that number 181,000. That's not a fantasy number. That's the exact number of people that Rick Scott last week began purging from the voter rolls of Florida. 181,000 illegal aliens. People like Jose Hernandez. There was once a guy named Jose Hernandez, believe it or not, who was deported. So every Jose Hernandez in Florida loses their vote. And I said, well, wait a minute. I called the Attorney General. My God, these are criminals. You get caught voting and you're not an American citizen, you automatically go to jail. There's never been a case where someone hasn't gone to jail they got caught. You go to jail, and then you get automatically deported. I said, how many of those 181,000 have you got? He said, well, I said, come on, you got their addresses, you got their names. They show up to vote. 
Why are, you know, how many of you busted? How, the jails must be filled. He said, well, we, one. <laughs> Actually found two, but one was an active duty Marine serving in Afghanistan who hadn't yet received the citizenship papers and his commander had registered him wrongly. Wow. The other was a Austrian Republican. <laughs> um, I won't say who, um, but one, that's true, an Austrian Republican, that's it. But 181,000 people, almost all of them Hispanic Americans, will lose their vote. Then, hanging chat, you thought that was all over with the Florida? Ohio, talk to Bob Fatrakis, okay? Uh, in Ohio, 2004, more hanging chads than were in Florida. Because of punch cards. I know you're worried about computer voting in Florida. It was the hanging chads, baby, that was a tremendous amount of vote, unbelievable vote loss. You want to know? That's called spoiled votes, by the way, hanging chads. It's part of the game, overvotes, undervotes. Now, wait a minute, I said, spoiled votes, there are one million. 451,116 spoiled votes in the last election. I said, how do you spoil a vote? Leave them out of the fridge? No, it's like, you know, they hang your chads, etc. Who's, but the question is, whose vote is spoiled? Who gets, whose chad gets hung? I know we all saw, I just like every bad reporter went to Palm Beach and saw, you know, had, you know, we had our pina coladas while we were filming, uh, you know, the, the chicks in bikinis, you know, and that, that was, oh, the butterfly ballot. Okay, but you know what? You go to Gad's account, you where one in six votes is thrown in the garbage can, blackest of 67 counties in Florida. Your chance of losing your vote through spoilage, okay, is 900% higher if you're black than you're white. That's the United States Civil Rights Commission analysis. 900% higher if you're black than you're white. And 2012. I go to Ohio for Democracy Now! And I get, I'm with souls to the souls to the polls. I'm following a Baptist church to vote. There are, there used to be dozens, Bob could tell you, dozens of voting places for early voting. Black people vote early because you remember what happened in 2004, right? And they waited for eight hours in the race and they don't know, so they all go early to the polls. So what they did was they, they, they solved that problem. They have dozens of early voting stations. Now, one per county, one for Cleveland, one for Dayton. I was in the Dayton line. 80,000 people voted on a single day in one place because they were ordered to. But when I say voted, I don't know if they voted. Because you know what happened? I waited in line five hours with the, with the people from the church. Okay? With the church group. They waited. No one would get out of line. No one. I didn't see a single person. Okay? And then they got to a room, and they didn't go into a polling place. Because they no longer, they ordered the removal, the closure of the, of the polling booths. Instead, you went into a room, and they gave you a request for an absentee ballot. Oh, no. Now, these people were at the, at, the, at the voting clerk's office, county clerk. They weren't absent from anything. Yeah. What was absent was democracy. They got an absentee ballot. So, and, and a request for an absentee ballot, and then an absentee ballot. And I go, what the hell is going on? So it's the middle, I, I call up uh, Bob, and he, he's one of the worst things. But he said, this can't be. I said, Bob, just sit there. I got there, I got to Columbus at one in the morning. Got out of bed. Well, actually, it wasn't even in bed. He was working away. So it's one in the morning. I said, Bob, look at this. Look at this. Well, I don't have one with me. Absentee, ba absentee ballot request. And then they were given from the request, if they were accepted, they got the absentee ballot. They fill out why. The answer is, let me give you this number, 488,136 absentee ballots were disqualified in the election. Half a million ballots. You, you know what? Don't go postal. You know, you say, oh, God, I don't want to vote on a computer, so I'll mail in my ballot. So the guys are going to steal your vote. Instead, you just hand them your ballot and expect them to, to count it. Oh, it fell be. You know, how many votes actually get counted? Do you know what? Okay, other than the state of Oregon, do you know if your vote's been counted when you mail it in? Do you have any idea? The state of Oregon, you should know. state of Oregon, that you can find out. And if, now, and why doesn't your vote get counted if it's absentee? Well, you saw my mom. She, didn't, she put in... She wrote in a candidate's name. Jill, you'll love this, Madam President. She wrote in the candidate's name. Donna Fry won as mayor of San Diego, won the race. And then the Republican official said, wait a minute. We're going back to this. She won as a writing candidate, can you imagine, for mayor of San Diego by several thousand votes. And then they went back and they said, wait a minute. We're going to look at each of those, of those write-in votes. And if they didn't add the E at the end of her name, out. 
Aww. She agreed that the ones that said surfer chick, she's a famous uh, surfer, yeah. <laughs> could go out. Blonde could go out. There are a lot of them. Um, but the people like my parents didn't, and my lawyer sister, didn't fill in the bubble next. You had to not only fill in the candidate's name, you had to fill in a bubble next to it. And if you put an X, you lost your vote. This is what's been happened. And so they took away the race from her. Now, the question is, okay, when I, that number 5.9 million votes, that's if our prayers come true. That was in the analysis. I used to be a statistician. That's the analysis, the number of votes that were illegally lost in 2008 election. It was worse in 12. Some of the worst elections we've had. And but what's coming up, 100, you just saw it, five states already with the ID laws, et cetera. Now, absentee ballots, spoiled ballots. There are nine caging, purging. There are nine ways to steal a vote. So this book is called Billionaires and Ballot Ban. It's how to steal an election in nine easy steps. It's also about the Koch brothers and their buck buddies. See, no one steals votes to win elections. They steal votes to steal the money. Mm -hmm. David Koch ran for governor of Kansas as a Democrat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don't forget, okay? It's not about party, okay? Right. Amen. By the way, you can learn about what their role is in the XL pipeline in this film because you heard Kennedy, there's something you can do about it. And I'll tell you the first yeah, thing you're gonna do about this. Okay. Nine ways to steal the vote, actually the lines are that, when you saw those lines I was walking on, the hours of lines, who was in those lines? Oh, the Pew Charitable Foundation, they, they considered, they said, Florida only had an average 20 minutes of a vote time. What's everyone complaining about? Oh, well, let's just look at, that's if you include the white weight. If I, I took a film in Ohio, I was waiting in line five hours for the black voters, so I decided, well, what does it look like in a white voting station? How long did I have to wait? I didn't have to wait. In fact, they came out with a cup of coffee. They said, come in. <laughs> the, the black people were waiting in a cold garage. If you're a white voter, they had more poll workers and stations than they had voters. Okay, now, and that's what I want to talk to you about. And I saw it was a great image for the organization here to uh, have. It was a black hand and a white hand together. Can I see the black hands here? Yeah. Well, okay, we've got a problem. Okay. It's not a South African cricket match of 1950, guys. We, okay. And then I go over to Souls to the Poles, and when I arrive, we now have a white person, okay? I have nothing against white people. Both my parents are white. Okay, now, okay. But here's the thing, okay? I go to the churches. I go to Reverend Jackson. How can we recreate the alliance? I said, you know, the black-white alliance. I said, well, Jesse, how about inviting some people for dinner? You'd have to give up the vegan thing for a night. But... Okay, we have to break some silos here. There's a lot of concentration here on things that do threaten white voters, like computer voting. But you have to remember, if you're a black person, you don't get to vote anyway. You don't get to vote. Those computers were like, that would be like uh, spending the night at the Ritz. When those black voters came in, they saw those computer machines, and they weren't allowed to touch them. They got absentee ballot requests. And then when they weren't allowed that, they were given something called provisional ballots. Provisional ballots. We had in the last election cycle where they kept a record. Let's see. I just want to look at this number myself here. Oh, yeah. We had, um, um, oh, yeah, 767,023 provisional ballots, three quarters of a million provisional ballots that were thrown away. People voted and their ballots were rejected. What, they're criminals illegally voting? Go arrest them. No, because, because I went to one Indian reservation, okay, with David Iglesias, who was an attorney, uh, you know, the U.S. attorney, who was, by the way, who was looking, he was told to look for vote fraud, and he found it. He found that the elections officials were taking away the votes of, of Hispanic and Indian people. So Carl Rove said, oh my God, he found illegal voters, so they fired him. <laughs> what they said is you're supposed to fo go find not the people stealing the vote, you're supposed to find the victims and arrest them. And he said to me, he said they literally wanted me to arrest George Bush and Karl Rove. Karl Rove wanted him to arrest innocent voters. He says, I can't find them. I've looked all over the Mesa. Give me these stupid gauging lists. There's no illegal voters here. And, he, and they said, arrest some anyway. I kid you not. He right. said, this is the United States, not the Soviet Union. They said, oh, well, you know, we'll let them go later. He says, you're going to arrest people for crimes you know they didn't commit and he wouldn't do that. They fired him. Okay, And they replaced one of the U.S. prosecutors with a guy named Tim Griffin 
who was the guy who made up the caging list for Karl Rove. And where is he now? I exposed him, and he was in tears crying, that British reporter, oh, I lost my job. He's in the United States Congress today as the chief sponsor of the bill for the XL Keystone Pipeline. Oh, yeah. And he got there by one way. Who, would, who in the world would take a totally discredited politician, Karl Rove's assistant, caught red-handed in corruption and vote theft? How could he get into office is a four-letter word, K-O-C-H. They gave him $167,000. Okay? For $167,000, a congressman will wash, will wash your car with their tongue. Okay? So that's how Tim Griffin got there, and the first thing they said is, where's our pipe? Oh, and by the way, the first extension of the Keystone Pipeline was built and immediately cracked and destroyed an entire part of Tim Griffin's district. Oh. And he was just in the paper last week saying, they're not doing anything about this pipeline that, that cracked in my district. He's still on the coke payroll as their guy. What's his district? Where is it? Okay, in Where Arkansas, Arkansas. Little Rock, Arkansas. Oh, that's, oh, now, yeah. that was, that's how it works. Oh it is not about stealing votes. It's about stealing the treasury. It's about stealing your government. It's not partisan. Okay? When David Glacius and I went out to the Indian Reservation, the Indians all lost their votes because they said, oh, you're, you're not citizens. They were Americans before there was America. They were not citizens, so they gave them provisional ballots. It's okay, provisional ballots, but <clears throat> provisional ballots, and they threw them all out because they didn't use the right envelopes because the officials gave them the wrong envelopes. And Iglesias busted this game. It was Democrats who did that to the Indians, who were Democrats, all of them. You can't shoot an arrow on an Indian reservation without hitting a Democrat. I mean, that's how it is. But why? The answer is because there's a uranium mine that the natives are trying, Native Americans are trying to eliminate because it was poisoning their fields. They're killing their kids. And they said, we don't want this, we're going to vote against this. Suddenly, suddenly the Democratic Party couldn't handle, they didn't want no engines in their party. Okay, suddenly. Is this yep. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. That's a good point. So we got to wrap it up. We're going to put, we're going to break the silos. When we're going to do it, Bob talked about we need something, you know, smart, humorous, like, and what, here's what we're going to do. That film, Billionaires and Ballot Bands, this is produced by you. It's an experiment in citizen journalism. I'm doing it with Bobby Kennedy and others. Look, what we're going to do is you go to Triple W. GregPalace.com, www.gregpalace.com, okay? And there, individually, but especially if you have organizations, sign on. You'll see at the back of the book a whole bunch of progressive organizations that are signing on. I want your information. I want your organization to be part of this. You be the producers. We need, we need, we need, yes, the NSA for our list, but we need you, okay? This is going to be, we're going to, instead of moguls out of Hollywood, it's going to be you and me and we're going to put this film out. It'll have all, it'll break the silos, it will have the presto digitizing, the presto change -o, um, you know, magical voting machines, but we'll also have the purges, we'll also have the, the, the uh, spoilage of the black votes, we'll have the hung chads, you name it, it's the whole, it's all the ways that they steal and who steals it. It won't just be what, how they steal, but who it is. Let's talk about these ideas, bust the silos, and thank you, bless you. This is the beginning, this is the end of the meeting, it's the beginning of the movement. Thank Woo! you. Yeah.